All right, there we go. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see you. Um, and that's true. If you have any Bigfoot stories, please <coughs> let me know. OK, so uh, I just want to like open this with a little uh, passage from Old Man in the Sea, Hemingway, which is uh, the point where the fisherman is just hooked, you know, this enormous marlin, and you know, it's towing him way out into the ocean. Uh, so let's kick this off. Uh, then he looked behind him and saw that no land was visible. But that makes no difference, he thought. I can always come in on the glow from Havana. There are two more hours before the sun uh, sets, and maybe he will come up before that. If he doesn't, maybe he will come up with the moon. If he does not do that, maybe he will come up with the sunrise. I have no cramps, and I feel strong. And it is he that has the hook in his mouth. But what a fish to pull like that. It is he who has the hook in his mouth, you know. Is the fish the only one hooked, though? I mean, technically, yeah, because the fisherman can choose when the battle ends any time he wants by cutting the line. The fish can't do that. But if you've caught nothing like this before, and fishing is part of who you are, and it's the biggest fish you've ever seen on the other end, then what would it take you to cut that line? See, I was drawing this map in North America for what sort of felt like a you know, geological epoch. <laughs> And I've been reflecting about it a lot since completing it. Um, for the third year in a row now, I'm speaking about it at NASIS. And so a lot of people in the audience will be familiar with the backstory and everything. I'm not going to cover things that you already know. So I'm sorry for people who are uh, coming across this project for the first time. These are the absolute basic stats about it. Um, and also, you can YouTube my previous talks uh, at NASIS. So there's three of those. It's my name and NASIS on YouTube. So. Um, but this year, the talk is a little different because it's actually finished. Only four years and nine months later. All right. <laughs> Which, that's not too long, is it, really? So, um, yeah, back in February, I finally signed it off. And <clears throat> honestly, it was a very emotional moment, of course. Uh, I've been dreaming of this for half a decade. And uh, thousands of hours of my life have played out on this one piece of paper. And completing it left me feeling obviously triumphant on the one hand, but also kind of lost, you know, and even sad, like a, like a breakup. And that passage from Old Man in the Sea, it reminds me of those early days when I was drawing it, long before I even came to my first nasus back in 2016. I was just out there in that boat alone, being towed out deep by a map that I could barely see, um, squaring off in this you know, battle of endurance. Um, and thoughts about printing and fulfillment and everything, they were just a distant fantasy. Um, I just wondered what the map might look like. Uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, that's early days when it used to be in my bedroom and, you know, uh, you try going to sleep when your project's just hovering over you like that. <laughs> it's horrible. But yeah, so I was 24 when I started this, back in 2014, and there was no commercial vision, no business plan. I was, I was young, I was quite lost at the time, and I needed somewhere productive to put my energy. And through hand-drawn maps, I'd found this creative space in which I could find a solace, where I could deposit you know, fear and pain and you know, also a place to seek adventure. Um, you know, the map was kind of like a portal to another dimension, the lion and the witch in my wardrobe. Uh, oh yeah, so this kind of tracks it through the years. Um, so from the refrigerator onwards, and those of you who are familiar with the work will know that it was first drafted on a fridge in Montreal. But from that fridge onwards, I'd found this game that lit my imagination on fire. You know, a game of pencils and geography. And I imagined a map of a scale, scale like this since I was a little kid, but I'd never dared to take it on. But there I was. Um, and while finishing the drawing was the incentive from the start, to actually finish this project is the prince, obviously, you know. Then I can let the map go and get it out to the world. You know, a lot of people have been waiting a long time for prints, and I want them to have it. I uh, let it live a thousand lives with friends and strangers, and I can get back to making maps, which is what I really want to be doing. Um, so that's part of what I'm here to talk to you about today. You know, when and how is the map going to be printed? What are some of the things I've had to consider in that journey? And also just some reflections on that transition from being creative all day to, to business, you know, and what cre creativity really feels like to me. But first, we'll just take a really quick look at how the map was finished. Um, the most obvious differences since last year are the stars and the cartouche. And the projection I used at the beginning was just Google Earth. Oh dear, those contrasts are just way out. Anyway, that's a familiar theme, this one, so that's fine. Uh, but yeah, the, um, 
uh, it was just Google Earth zoomed out a perspective projection, so I was able to set the map in the stars, which I'm really happy with, and also to mess with the flat earthers, I think. <laughs> but I chose actual constellations for all four corners. For example, here you've got Ursa Major and Ursa Minor and the North Star from Alaska's flag, which is Alaska's corner, and they're also universal symbols of the polar north, of course. Um, down in the corner that faces New Zealand, uh, my home, um, I have Orion's Belt, which is very visible in our skies as well, but it's rotated here to the Northern Hemisphere perspective, obviously. Um, and then came the cartouche, which might have gotten a little bit out of hand. It, <laughs> it was an entire project all by itself. Uh, it actually took 160 hours uh, to draw, to design and draw. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry again about the, uh, the quality here, but anyway, it looks good on my computer, so. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I wanted an emblem for the map and something that would do this project justice. And this, this was hard, right? You know, so I, I went with the title Portrait of a Continent to keep it open if I do other continents in the future. So it might be part of a set. Um, I think Antarctica is the top front runner at the moment for the <laughs> next continent. <laughs> uh, so this is designed to be quite literally a portrait of North America. It's the mini map, same projection right in the middle, encircled by a frame of the portrait. And the frame itself is a kind of cornucopia of iconic North America with features positioned relative to their location. And there's a lot of things here. I mean, like dozens of peaks, 50 animals, um, obviously cities you've got uh, from Quebec, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, Chicago, New York, DC. Niagara Falls is just like hanging out there between Toronto and Chicago. Obviously this, this kind of wheel method uh, biases heavily for coastal regions. Um, but uh, work, you know, that's the Mississippi, Missouri, kind of touching through the St. Louis Arch there down to the St. Louis Cathedral in New Orleans and all this kind of thing. Out on the west side, you've got uh, Denali up there, just where the P on the portrait is. Um, you've got uh, well, all kinds of things that are pretty familiar. Uh, Seattle, Crater Lake, uh, the Bixby Creek Bridge in Big Sur. There's uh, the Grand Canyon. And then if you go into the, hang on, the next frame here, it cuts down into Mexico now. Uh, so past that little Texas corner with Guadalupe Peak and the Alamo and all of that. And it's the, um, right into the heart of, of central Mexico. And that's the, the eagle on the cactus holding the snake from the Mexican coat of arms and the flag. You've got pyramids like uh, Teotihuacan and Chichen Itza and Tikal down in Guatemala. Um, you know, just a lot of uh, really recognizable symbols from Mexico as well. And that goes into Central America and the Caribbean here, which I've loaded with flags because I wanted the flag of every sovereign country on this map to be on the cartouche because, well, I put the US and Canadian flags and it was like, okay, now I need to do all of those as well. So it gets a little flag heavy, but uh, it works. Anyway, that's uh, the cartouche. Oh, and then there's the sign-off scroll, which um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to resize a few things there. The date's too prominent, you know. I'm encouraging the map to date, I think, so I need to just bring that in a bit. But the, the, it's specifically being held by a scarlet macaw um, because well, I wanted an animal to be holding up my name to emphasize that it is the content that holds me up. It's not the other way around. The reason that this map works and the reason that I have so much to draw is because the world is so interesting. You know, this map has always just been a love letter to geography and uh, there's no Easter eggs with me wandering the map. People often ask, it's like, no, this is, I mean, obviously the, my vision is coming through in every pencil stroke in the map, but I'm not choosing content based on my own travels or anything like that. I think that would undermine um, what I think the map is about. Anyway, once it was signed off uh, in February, the journey was far from over. Let's see, yeah, cool. It was business time. And the first step, naturally, was image capture. It's time to get that, that file. And I've had the map scanned or photographed six times during its lifetime to ensure that I had a digital backup and when I brought prints over here of recent years. And the original is very precious. It's still in my studio. I'm still figuring out what to do with it. By the way, the original in the map, uh, sorry, the print in the map gallery was not the original. A few people asked me, um, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. no. Um, that was a print, but it's exactly one to one the size of the original. So what you saw was 100%. Uh, but yeah, each, each effort at image capture is a big ordeal. I've never rolled the map up to this day, so I have to borrow my friend's old Toyota Prado and like wedge the board into this truck and then drive it, um, you know, just a harrowing drive. Once I drove it all the way from Melbourne to Sydney, which is nine hours one way, because Sydney has Australia's biggest scanner, and I thought, oh, cool. That, uh, <laughs> 
the scan was all right, but <laughs> the road trip sucked. <laughs> Um, but finally, this amazing photographer in Melbourne, shout out to Justin Cooper, he came to the rescue. He was able to pull it off and, you know. So yeah, we just created a mount for the map, attached it to the wall, uh, keep it nice and flat and parallel to the lens. And uh, Justin's camera was on a stand that we sort of slid horizontally and vertically to capture 25 separate frames and then used photo merge on Photoshop to stitch it all together, which took hours to process. But the result was almost seamless. I think we might've had maybe one decapitated moose somewhere, but. But the most part, it was perfect. Um, and photo merge thrives on images where there's a lot of diverse content to grab. So my map was a pretty good candidate for that. Um, so yeah, finally, after years of uncertainty, if this could even be done, I was presented with an enormous big file. It's like 20 by 24,000 pixels. And <clears throat> having that file has definitely opened up whole new possibilities for procrastination. <clears throat> <laughs> I kind of like the bison bats. I mean, it's going to work for me. <laughs> but. <clears throat> Yeah, we've got a wolf spider. We've got some. Uh, so yeah, with, with <laughs> you're welcome to use these for map monsters. Just kind of get, yeah. anyway. Uh, so with the capture done, I was able to start test printing. And printing options have basically come down to two main camps, from what I can see. But I'm still, you know, interested in all ideas. One is the fine art inkjet printing, which is often called jiclay, um, which is expensive, but it has exquisite, rich colours and textures and. For my map, with all the pencil strokes and the organic tones and everything, the, the Giclay prints can really give you the impression you're looking at an original. They're on heavy art paper, it's archival inks, and they're good for a you know, limited edition run. But the other camp is, um, is offset lithography, obviously, and offset has a much lower unit cost, and you go in bulk and is well suited for a higher volume of posters, and look, the quality is still excellent, and it has plenty of upside from a production you know, standpoint. So most importantly, it means I can offer a version of the map at an affordable price. Um, so selling both Jekyll and Offset to me addresses the contrast that has always been at the heart of this map. And I guess at the heart of cartography, you know, quite often is the map is an art product, but uh, also as an accessible geography resource, you know. On the one hand, yeah, it took five years of relentless hand drawing, and painstaking illustration, but on the other, I want anyone to be able to access it if they want, you know, within reason. And even if it isn't about budget exactly, like maps have diverse uses. Uh, I know folks who want to stick it up in their house truck for a North American road trip, or a lot of parents want it for their children, you know. Many school teachers have talked about having it pinned up in their classroom where the kids can enjoy it. So I don't think they want a limited edition fine art print, you know. Um, and I don't care about, and I don't have pretensions about it at all, you know. This map has always been an organic process. It was drafted on a refrigerator. Like, if you want to tack it to the wall and let your nine-year-old run their fingers all over it, that's awesome. What matters to me is that people can enjoy the map and engage with it, engage with it however they want. Um, so anyway, the offsets will be printed and distributed here in the USA, and the fine art prints will be done in Melbourne because it's a lot more hands-on and much, much lower volume. And I'm going to put them on pre-order early December, we're looking like, with the fulfillment beginning early in the new year. So um, shoot me a message if you want to be on the list or anything. Anyway, this is all regarding the full map, but crops are another question. Not going to go into crops anytime soon, but uh, you know, I want the whole thing to just be released as one initially. Um, now, just something I want to touch on quickly is like you might have noticed that the map is completely loaded with content and symbols that are unlabeled, and I want to bring out the stories in the map and bolster its educational potential and, and the engagement. Some. Some of you might remember my Missouri River tour from last year, and that kind of gives you an idea of just how much is there that I'm not able to explain purely from prints. So there's a few different ways to do that. One is the coffee table book I've been thinking about for quite a while, and I'm you know, working on that, but uh, that's obviously not going to happen overnight. Another one, which was actually a great suggestion from Tim uh, Miko, is an AR app that you know, by using your phone, you could uh, scan across the map and it would show up all labels and clickable POIs, so that sounds really cool. But it's also really tech, so if anybody in the room is, you know, uh, that sounds like something that you might be able to help with, please come talk to me. And the other option is to make an interactive version of the map on my website where I can pin POIs all over it. People can, uh, you know, request me to add things and, um, yeah, might even be able to geo-reference it so you can search by place. Because I think articulating the content it's so important, it will expand the potential of the map. And um, I, know, I don't want to spell out everything. I like that it has a lot of mystery, but there's, there's a lot going on. We can definitely do a bit. So um, since signing off in February, I've had to do a lot of homework and really shift my, yeah, 
change hats, you might say. A lot of agonizing over possibilities. For example, I wrote three different scripts for a Kickstarter video before I decided not to do a Kickstarter. <laughs> um, so the journey has not been a straight line, and sometimes you have to really meander through the landscape to figure out what you're doing. And for five years, I put nearly everything aside, just holding down this part-time day job just to keep my lights on and drawing the map in my free time. For five years, all I did was draw, almost, apart from when I came over here. But, you know, and <laughs> delaying these business questions while being out at sea with a map that never ended. So there's been a lot to catch up on this year. And, and this, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, where's my tape? There it is. So this kind of illustrates what it feels like, the difference. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because uh, this is like my first release of anything, you know, and it turns out that printing a huge detailed colour pencil map of North America drawn by a Kiwi in Australia is not like, it's easier said than done. And there's a lot to consider for anyone who's printing a map for the first time, I think, let alone one like this. And it's not just questions about the printing methods and the quantities and prices, it's all these things. And it's also like at a zoomed out level, like what's your story, you know? Why do or should people care? And who the hell are you? And, and these questions kind of come up through that, that journey, and I've appreciated being able to put, be put through that. But um, yeah, fortunately though, experience is everything, and as you go along, it gets easier. Um, but yeah, these are the kind of questions an artist will have to confront at some point as they try to balance creativity with the demands of business. And I've personally found the transition hard. You know? The drawing might have taken forever, but it was so easy to stay on task. Like Part of what made that map so immersive is the endless focus on the one plane. It's like working on a giant jigsaw puzzle and you're making the pieces yourself as you go. Just you and a map squaring off, caught in a battle of endurance. Uh, it was too compelling. Like, you know, when, when work really clicks with you, it taps into your life force and takes you over, you know? Like when I had a good day on the map, made a breakthrough, I'd take a walk around the neighborhood and the entire world would just be singing. It's a beautiful feeling to be creating. And creativity isn't fuel specific to any task, it's an aquifer that's you know, relevant to everything in your life. You, know? you get pulled by that fish out into the depths and you keep holding the line. And I feel like if you can, can carve out the space in your life to get really lost in a project from time to time, it will take you to surprising places. But you might have to let it consume you a little bit. You know? And who says it has to be healthy? You, know, you should fear the fish, just as you love the fish. You know, <laughs> once upon a time, I worked 50 hours a week as a cook, and I'd get up at five in the morning to service someone else's, you know, dream. Um, so damn right I should put myself through that uh, for my own aspirations, right? You know, good things usually aren't easy, and uh, why should they be? I think a deep creative journey can be a bit of a psychological challenge that tears you apart and puts you back together. That's therapy, you know? Who cares how much you start talking to yourself? <laughs> you know you're not crazy, so it's fine. <laughs> Now, I'm not advocating for that tortured artist model thing because balance in life is critical. But I still think, like, you know, you might be obscuring the value of a deeper sacrifice to creativity if you uh, just go for the life hack all the time. So it's like that Robert Johnson pact with the devil. And I think that if sometimes you get lost in your work to a degree that seems unhealthy, parts of your life go neglected, rate this against the quality of your work, not the perception that you might be losing your mind. <laughs> Now, don't go off the edge of the cliff, but just like you can, you know, you can take a look, see what's there. Um, you might, you know, yeah, you need to get towed out sometimes, I think. But that's, now, this is just my experience, of course. Everyone's different, so take it for what it's worth to you. But here I'm talking about creating because then there's business. And if you've read Old Man in the Sea, you'll know that the fisherman catches the marlin, uh, but it's devoured by sharks on the way back to shore. The fish was too big for his boat, and he was alone and didn't have the boy on board to help, and he could just strap it to the side of the skiff and like try to get it back. But the sharks came, once he got back, all that remained was the head and the tail, which were just mere trophies against the uh, value of the flesh that was lost to the sea. So creators have to be careful, I think. You know, it's one thing to have the ability, the talent. It's another to actually make something people want, and it's another thing altogether uh, to bring that product to market and to tell a story. Uh, but if you honestly are in love with what you do, uh, then I think that's probably the most important thing. <coughs> and uh, anyway, this is the landscape I've been traversing this year a bit. And uh, yeah, we'll just, uh, you know, I, I guess I've kind of always been out there alone in a way with the drawing, um, but certainly not in terms of everything else. You know, there are many people, in, including in this room, who've been wonderful friends to me and the map over the years. And I can't describe how grateful I am uh, for the support and encouragement and friendship from the NASIS community. I just mean 
I was alone there, you know, drawing it, putting those hours in. <laughs> you know, wouldn't see people for weeks and, and wondering if I was going mad. And uh, nope, we got there. So um, anyway, I think if you're trying to supercharge your creative journey, sometimes don't worry about getting lost. Uh, just become the map. Thank you.